Okay, hi everyone. Uh, this topic is a core topic, something that we call a core topic in geometry processing. It's like one of the basic, uh, uh, really like one of the basic problems uh, in uh, digital geometry processing. Um, first, I will just tell a few words about INRIA. Uh, INRIA, I'm, uh, it's uh, the French Institute for Computer Science. So as you can see, there are eight main centers in France. We are 4,500 people, not only researchers. There are many like students and also technical support. And I am from this center uh, near the Mediterranean, Sofia Antipolis. And of course, like everybody else, <laughs> we are recruiting. <laughs> so if you are willing to uh, enter a PhD program or do some an internship in our team, please contact me. Okay, so first the outline of, the, of, my, of this course, uh, it has to fit in one hour and a half, so I tried to uh, select a few uh, approaches, and I will first do, uh, show you some con the context of uh, surface construction, especially in terms of sensors and applications. Then I will state the problem. There are, not, there are many ways to state this problem, depending on the type of measurements, but I think I will choose one. And then I will... Uh, show you a review of some of the main approaches in the, in, that, in the field and also some less common. And I will also make a close-up on um, a focus on our quest for robustness. That's uh, something that is uh, of high interest, at least for me <laughs> and for my group. Uh, quest for robustness means we want to devise algorithms that are stable, even uh, when taking uh, imperfect data as input. Okay. And I will explain to you also a little bit the context. If there are any questions, I think you can interrupt me. Uh, I will also do show you some live demos while, while, while we go. And, uh, and then at the end, I will uh, tell you how you can download also the demo from the SIGA library. OK, so this is the context about the sensors. So we, of course, there are many technological advances on sensors. And the, the main evolution that we, uh, we witnessed was that there was an evolution from Contact sensors, so this is a contact sensor, okay? It looks like a finger, it's a mechanical finger, and then uh, this was mainly done for a quality control when you manufacture here a, a, a mechanical piece, for instance, and then this finger can really accurately measure a, a 1D coordinate along this finger, okay? There is a translation here, and there was an evolution from contact to contact-free, okay? I just remind some obvious things over here, obvious facts, and then there were some uh, scanners, like laser scanners. That's also one means, very uh, uh, <coughs> common means to acquire uh, geometry. And this is, this is the uh, uh, so-called crayon la la laser. So you see there is an articulated arm here that's able to record the, uh, the pose of this arm. And then there is a laser attached to it. Okay? And this laser acts like a brush. Imagine a, l a laser brush, and then you can sweep it around your objects, and you will have a set of points that have very high anisotropic sampling. I will show you an example later. This is a laser scanner from Minolta. Looks like a big shoe box. And this is also another uh, LIDAR, like laser technology also. Uh, you have also other uh, means to measure geometry, but this is more from, uh, for outside, seeing that, you think that you see a sensor that you see on the, on the roof of cars sometimes uh, for outdoor scanning. Have also a laser scanners attached to uh, aerial, like to, uh, to planes. This is from uh, aerial views. You can also have uh, photographs, and then from the photos, uh, acquire some geometry using uh, computer vision methods. And also in remote sensing from satellite, of course. So another evolution, very important, that was from short to la very long range sensing. Okay, this is two obvious evolution that we witnessed. Something that is less obvious, and I will mention that to you later, is that, of course, the technology advances, but the data every year <laughs> are not getting any better. It's some, uh, something I call a technological paradox, and I will tell you a little bit why. <laughs> That's a problem for us. Um, also, we can also see that as an opportunity, like a scientific challenge. So, then, uh, if you look at the sensors themselves, you can have also structure light sensors. This is a Kinect sensor, typically infrared, an active sensor that projects some light, and um, <coughs> some structured light here infrared. 
you can have some passive stereo vision devices where there are more matching images and using stereo techniques able to recover some deaf. So that gives you some deaf images. Uh, this has, the Kinect has a limited deaf. Cannot see uh, uh, beyond a certain distance, which I think is in meters. This can see up to 20 meters, and after 20 meters, in this image, it says this is far. That's all. You have a pixel value that says this is far. Okay, not more than that. And then, of course, you can do something called photo modeling using computer vision techniques. You take several photos here around an object. Usually, you need to respect a certain protocol, a certain way the images have to overlap, and so on. And if you follow a, a careful, <laughs> carefully designed protocol, then you can reach today um, using state-of-the-art libraries uh, very impressive densities that are getting close to what you can get with a, with a laser scanner. But you have to be extremely careful about the type of sensor you are using and the protocol. Okay, and um, there is another context that is very quickly evolving also, m m more recent, is that the sense, the trend is really to instrument the sensors. Now you can have a sensor like a laser scanner, but around it is like a Christmas tree. You have plenty of sensors everywhere. You can have an accelerometer. Okay, if you integrate twice, you can know the location of your sensor. You can have a GPS. You can have a gyroscope um, to know the orientation of it. You can have even uh, optical gyrometer. It's really like optical fibers that is uh <coughs> uh, rolled around a small uh, cylinder, and then you can very accurately measure the orientation of a sensor. You can have a compass or mag magnetometer, and you can have also all, all that put on a robotized platform, like a drone, of course, okay? And this is, of course, um, incredibly um, increases the capability to acquire data. So it becomes really routine to generate data sets. This is an old example, a few years back, from uh, Navtech data acquired from Navtech. So they put this uh, Velodyne scanner on the, on, the, on the roof of a car. The car is here. And then this way we can start, we can say that today it's possible to digitize the physical world, basically, at the scale of entire cities. And this, I think this car was acquiring, it acquires not only laser points, but also using uh, panoramic cameras. You can have also the color per point. And this acquires 100 million points per kilometer. So it's easy to fill hard disk. Huh? No problem. So what are the applications? Yes? Um, what about the depth vision there? So uh, there is also some limited depth, but then I think the distance is considerably higher. I think from uh, what the, the laser we tried at Inria, we could see up to 300 meters. But I think you can do even better than that. But it was typically in the range of 300 meters. So, and, uh, and then of course, when they put also LIDAR scanners on an on a, on a airplane, then it's much more than that. But of course, there is a trade-off, right? Like uh, how far you can see. The problem with these uh, scanners, laser scanners here in the city, is that you have also a coefficient with each point, which is the uh, reflectivity. Like that, you can relate that somehow, not directly to the notion of uh, uh, relevance or reliability of the measure. Then, of course, if you have absorbing surfaces, and a very black or absorbing surfaces, you won't see anything. And if the surface is, like the, is very tangent, almost tangent to the surface, then in that case, you have almost nothing that comes back from it. You can also have uh, like uh, virtual uh, reflections, like ghost points, things like that. These data are far from being perfect. Huh? OK, so what are the applications? So I, again, I remind some of the obvious uh, for some of you who are not familiar on surface reconstruction. What can we do with uh, surface reconstruction methods? Well, uh, if you think of computational engineering, which amounts to uh, devise simulation algorithms, right? Because engineering became computational, like all the rest. So that means what do you do? You replace the physical uh, prototype by a virtual prototype, like a 3D model, and you replace the experience by some computation, by simulation, right? So this is computational engineering, but now we can do that at the scale of a city. This is an example of a thermal and uh, wind simulation in a city. Uh, then to do that, in, uh, let's say a faithful simulation, an accurate simulation, 
you can go outside, digitize the physical world around you, and then you need some reconstruction algorithm to do that. For reverse engineering, uh, reverse engineering is when you have a mechanical part or an object that maybe the, the concurrent of a company has or did, manufactured. In that case, uh, you can of course buy the car of your concurrent and you can uh, start scanning it if you want to understand um, whether the performance of, I don't know, a turbine or an engine is related to uh, the <coughs> geometry. Okay, so you can uh, do things like that. Computer-aided medicine, also you need to digitize if you want to do some patient-specific medicine. In that case, you need to measure the patient like uh, to, uh, to recover uh, the anatomy or the organs here. So you can do some computer-aided medicine. An example of surface reconstruction, this is uh, more difficult. I won't talk about it much, but I mentioned here, it's called fully reconstruction of blooming flowers. So th this is also relevant for biology. You can do some reverse engineering of the biology by taking several shots, laser scan here, of these blooming flowers in order to understand how does this process uh, evolve. Another topic is on scene interpretation. This is also getting increasingly uh, important today, uh, not only for uh, augmented or uh, uh, augmented reality or applications like that, but also it can be for uh, surveillance. It can be also for monitoring el elderly people. And uh, topics like and, uh, when you need to interpret a scene, uh, well, you need also some time very often to reconstruct the surfaces from the raw measurements. Another example of application is geology, archaeology, for uh, typically, like here, an example of underwater exploration. Uh, also, a means to, uh, to achieve this is to perform reconstruction. And also, if you want to digitize the cultural heritage data. Um, <coughs> This is an example from the Culture 3D Cloud project. It was a national project uh, carried out in France uh, for the digitization of our uh, cultural heritage, where you have many architectural uh, buildings like that. And uh, being for monitoring, for conservation, or for achieving purposes, uh, we need to digitize this very, very accurately. Uh, just a s small example of some of subset of applications of surface reconstruction. So <coughs> now I will state the problem. What is the, the problem I'm going to focus on today? Um, I will focus on a simpler subset of the problem. You can have many, many measurements, you, not only points, but today I will focus on the case where you have as input a dense point set. Okay, so just point, point wise measurements. Remember, if you do some medicines, if you take an ultrasonic sensor, you may have slices. Instead, you may have data acquired on the slice. Okay, there are also other type of sensors. Sometimes you can acquire more than points, like point or just orientation. You have also sensors that give you only the orientation of the surface, not the location, and things like that. So suppose I assume here uh, that I have a dense point set P sampled over a surface S. This is my input, and I want to generate as output a surface. Okay, so it's really about a conversion process. I want to, it's also there was all transition in dimension, right? Because these points are zero D entities and I want to reconstruct a two manifold embedded in R3. And so I want that the surface is an approximation of S, both in terms of topology and in terms of geometry. Is, can I assume that everybody knows the difference between topology and geometry? Yes, okay, good. <coughs> Okay, so this is a very general statement for this problem. It's a conversion problem. And of course, natural questions are under which condition am I going to recover? The geometry, the topology. Uh, when am I going to recover a surface in this process? Um, it's really, why is that a scientific challenge? Because this is really a core topic because this is uh, at the core of transitions between here, physical representations that you access only through measurements. Mathematical representation, because the surface, I can say it's a two-manifold, so that's something mathematics, abstract if you want, or continuous in a sense. And discrete, digital. I have a point set that has to be represented in this computer, right? So it's really about going from measurements to mathematics and discrete, and this is really 
uh, about the transitions between these three representations. So now, <laughs> this was in the ideal case, we start having a little problem here. It's not a dense point set, not always a dense point set. Okay, there are cases where it's too dense even, but very often, and the reason is why I will explain to you why. So we can have very imperfect sampling. That's the first issue we may have. We can have non-uniform sampling. Non-uniform simply due to the way we acquire the data, right? It can be also like the tangent angle. If you sweep a laser scanner here, I will acquire like that, right? On the top of the roof of the car, there is a revolving scanner. If you go like that, you will acquire many points over here, and then on this wall, almost tangent, you will get very few points. So the sampling will be non-uniform, with a very widely variable sampling. Anisotropic, I will show you an example. You can have also missing data, that is holes, be due to occlusions, right? Of course, like behind this table, I won't measure anything. It can be either because the scanner cannot go into a cavity, or just because of the self-occluding scene. I can also have uh, some absorbing surfaces, like black surfaces that will be absorbing. I can have a mirror, I can have a glass, and so on. And plus, because it's a measure, oh, by the way, this is an example of a point set generated uh, via uh, computer vision techniques it, uh, using a, a digital camera. And you see that there are some points, and for some reason there are no points over here. There are some points missing over here. This is an example of a hand. So this is my hand, okay? I molded my hand in plaster. We do that in our lab. And then uh, we brushed, I brushed my hand on a, let me show you an example, with this uh, crayon scanner. And I don't know if you can see that from where you are, but the sampling is extremely anisotropic. And on the right, you see from photographs, we took some photos and of this uh, little uh, sculpture here on the capital. And um, you see that I can have data that are very, uh, because of the matching algorithm, right? The computer vision algorithm needs to do some, to match the points between the photos. So if the matching is in incomplete, you get some outliers, some noise, some incomplete data. But just show you the, uh, what does this uh, point set look like? <coughs> So I'm, I'm loading a point set here that uh, for which I have already computed the normals, okay? So the normal directions to every point. <coughs> Just take some time to load it. And my computer, it's a small laptop with a uh, very bad graf graphics card, but hopefully it will be enough to, to show you what it looks like. And here I show the point with the normals. Let me switch to only the point. These are the splat, yes. You see the point set here? Right. I called you, you are like brushing the surface with this uh, laser, and you get very, very anisotropic sampling. And of course, because of these articulated arms, it's not perfect, right? There is some mechanics, you have some hysteresis. If you brush from right to left or left to right, you get some little shift in your data. So even the, you have basically two point sets that are not perfectly registered. That's another uh, issue with this data. Of course, you could also, I can also argue simply, as soon as you have a measurement process, you have some uncertainty, right? So you have some optics, you have some electronic, and you know if you buy an electronic device, like even a simple resistance, this property depends on the ambient temperature already. Okay, so it will fluctuate depending on many parameters. And this is what, what we are asked to uh, scan today. Okay, that's a problem. That's the issue is not related to the technologies that really advances. The problem is that every time you have a new sensor that gets out, the practitioners take the sensor and want to explore new areas. <laughs> and typically here, they went underwater. This was acquired by Dassault System. Uh, it's called, uh, the, this was a ship. It was a ship of the uh, King, uh, the Sun King's flagship, sank off the Toulon coastline in 1664. And they've, they've been there. It's uh, uh, not too far from where I am, from uh, the Toulon area. And you, when you go in the water, you see fishes. You see, this is a set of fishes. There, is, uh, there are plenty of uh, currents, uh, dust floating in the air, and things like that. And of course, uh, this is uh, 
already the surface is far from perfect. But I think you can recognize the canon, right? And this is the, the point set. And if you want to recognize that there is a canon, believe me, you have to move the point set around, otherwise you cannot even perceive it. Okay? So this is the frontier of what we can reconstruct today. This is really uh, the uh, frontier knowledge of what we can reconstruct. This is really not far from being satisfactory what we can do on this point set. Then um, in addition, so I continue the problem statement. Uh, I said we want the right topology and geometry, but sometimes there are other uh, properties we would like to have, either desired or sometimes good to have. Uh, sometimes you have like a point set like this, and <coughs> sometimes, very often for some application, 3D printing, simulation, fluid simulation, and so on, you want a surface that is watertight. Right? Even if you have very missing data, you, I could not go enter this. I could not enter the scanner in it. So I have only one side of this solid, right? But still, I would like, in some cases, to have always a watertight surface. So this adds some complication to the process. Intersection free, it's not obvious that uh, an algorithm would generate an intersection free surface. So if you want, again, to uh, your surface to be printable, uh, then very often it's required to be self intersection free. And there is something much harder to define accurately. There is it's really an ill posed problem, but very often you have noise in your data. And of course, noise and features are ambiguous, right? So, and sometimes what the practitioners want is a trade off between fidelity to the data and smoothness in a certain sense of the geometry. Sometimes they say, okay, I don't want a surface with 10 million points that pass through each point because there is some noise in the data. Right? So sometimes we want a trade-off between uh, like a simple geometry and fidelity to the data. And there is not a unique answer to this question. Okay. No questions about the problem statement? I continue. <laughs> uh, then I will greatly simplify. I will go back in 2D <laughs> and I show you a point set. And um, I claim that this is an ill pose problem already, right? I have a point set in 2D sampling a curve. And in fact, there are many candidate shapes for this reconstruction pro problem, right? I could draw a shape that passes through every point. I could go near the input point, right? I could say this is a valid reconstruction. <laughs> this guy is approximating, does not pass through every point. This is piecewise smooth. You see, there are sharp corners over here. So when should I create a sharp corner? This is uh, clearly ill-posed again. And this is so-called interpolant. This passes through every point. So here, the rule of the game is more to connect the dots, you know, like these games that you have for holiday uh, uh, notebooks for the kids. You want just to connect the dots. That's another instance of this problem. Okay, and if you look at the literature, of course, it was tackled from these different something that we call assumptions, right? When I select this one, I make an assumption. This is called a priori knowledge. I, I make an a priori knowledge here. The same for here. I say, okay, all my points are very reliable. I don't want, want to you to change that. I want to pass through each of my measurement points. Okay, that's an assumption I do. So that's uh, an introduction to the overview of the main approaches. Um, well, when I say main, it's not completely true. You will see at the end that uh, we wrote a survey on this problem, and there are 500 references to this reconstruction problem. No? It's not, uh, it's not uh, random. So there is something that we call a priors. The priors is especially this a priori knowledge that we, you know, when you have an ill-posed problem, what do you do? You need to regularize your problem. You need to reduce the solution space in which you search, right? And these are the three typical priors that are done. The smooth a priori knowledge. I search for trade-off between smoothness and fidelity to the data. I search for a piecewise smooth surface, or I, something I call simple. Simple, he translate into something piecewise linear, right? I draw line segments. That's another also, uh, you know, let's say, simplicity uh, 
prior that I do. Be careful, you have many, many more complications in terms of priors. You can have several notions of smoothness already, right? Smoothness, after all, that's a, uh, itself a rich concept. It can be a local smoothness. I can say locally it's smooth. In that case, the usual approach is performed by local fitting. So you see, for instance, if I take, I will reconstruct, I will just look, suppose, I look only in the vicinity of my surface, okay? I just move a small lens on my data points, and I look only locally, okay? In this vicinity, in this small disk, let's say I will fit a smooth surface to my data. I could fit locally a smooth surface, parametric surface, or here a line segment, right? In that case, I will not have control away from the data. That means I will not be able to fill very large gaps, very large holes, right? And very often, the solutions are found by interpolation. Namely, when you move this disk locally, you will generate, you will select another neighborhood and point cloud in this neighborhood, right? And therefore, if you think of this smooth fitting curve, or smooth fitting surface, right? You will have several ones when you move this disk. And usually this solution is found by interpolation, some kind of blending of these solutions, okay? This falls into the family of uh, so-called uh, point set surfaces. And um, so this uh, typically like moving least squares or things like that. Then you have another notion of smoothness that can be much more global. In that case, uh, it's different. You look for a notion of smooth surface. It can be not just a surface like here, a curve embedded in R2. It will be rather uh, typically an something we call an implicit function. You search for a function here from R2 to R. So you search in the space of function defined everywhere in space where the points are embedded. And then usually the solutions are found via global solvers. I will go back later into that, okay? Linear solvers, eigenvalue problems, graph cuts, things like that, okay? After, of course, designing the right data structure. And this is the goal is to be robust or resilient to missing data. When you have very large hole, this is a means to say, okay, even if I don't have any data over here, I will fill this hole completely because by construction, I will only search for a solid, okay? And I will obtain a watertight surface by construction. I just sketch a few of the ideas and then later on I will make a focus. And here, that's another assumption. I say it's a piecewise smoothness. So I just remind some of the obvious also for, for some of you who are not familiar with this concept. Piecewise smooth means what? It means I search for a surface that is sharp near the sharp features, near the features. Namely, uh, on this table, I have a crease, right? This is a sharp crease. I can have a corner, I can have the tip of a cone, I can have a cusp, I can have a dart, right? Which is a dying feature, a crease on the surface. Like a complex set of features that I can have. So it's sharp near these features and smooth away from these features, okay? It's very vague at the moment, but then I will come back to it later, later. okay? So. We have seen already three a priori knowledge and already three notions of smoothness. I continue. Then in the literature, I do a little bit of advice, advertisement for what we do in our team also. Sometimes you can have some very domain-specific priors. Suppose I say uh, what I reconstruct is an urban scene or it's a scene of objects made by humans. I know you will have a course after this one on fabrication. Okay, that's a typical assumption here we say, Okay, this, this is a building, this has been made by humans, and then you can rely on this a priori knowledge, which say the surfaces are, let's say, 80% made of planar parts, okay? In the buildings, 80% of the city are planar surfaces, easier to manufacture. And if that is the case, you can use this a priori knowledge to help reconstructing the surface. And then, of course, you start searching for the planar parts, searching from, for adjacencies between them, adjacencies, sharp creases, corners forming only between planar parts. And then you can structure your, restructure your point set. You see this is a point set that has been structured with corners resampled completely, completely resampled along creases, corners, and so on. And then we perform a reconstruction. 
That's another um, uh, domain-specific prior, very domain-specific, of an example of a paper we published uh, like two years ago on uh, uh, reconstruction of urban scenes, but this time with level of details. Okay, you and also in accordance with the semantic of urban scenes here, we say, okay, if I'm able to classify the scene to recognize what is a tree, what is a facade, what is a roof, what is a superstructure, superstructure is a cheminée or a terrace and the roof. In that case, if I can first classify the data, I can leverage the semantic information to help reconstructing the surface. And also I can generate a surface, not one reconstructed scene, but uh, levels of details in accordance with the CTGML uh, de facto norm, which says that load zero is the floor plan. Level one is a set of shoe boxes. This one, level two, is with the roofs. And level three is with the facades and the cheminées. Okay. But this, I won't go into more details okay, for this part. I, I fold that completely. And I am back to uh, <laughs> the very basic assumption. Okay. So now I'm entering into the detail of some of the approaches. I cannot be exhaustive in an hour and a half. I just want you to give you the, the will to maybe read more on that topic and read a few papers. And of course, the survey I will advertise at the end will be a means for you to save time because we also structure the survey along these lines. The first prior was simple, yes? Uh, one question maybe in cover and later. Uh, I think one of the main challenges in reconstruction now is lack of any ground truth. Right. Do you also feel the same or do you also encounter this? Because this notion we have also tried similar thought prior to different context. But uh, like in the today's morning when we had this learning. Yes, process, learning. Yes. Lack of yes. any ground truth. Absolutely. Yes. Synthetic scans are just. I completely ready. agree. It's what is very strange these days is that the people who uh, plan to devise a technique for, let's say, um, Kinect data, they take the laser scanner as ground truth. <laughs> and so on. You can recur this way, okay? Like you take a crappy sensor. Or, or let's say very bad, but very, very time efficient sensor. And you take the better one, just the range above it, as a grand truth, thing like that. But it's, you are right, it's very, very hard today to get data that have been, for instance, certified, certified by someone. You know, you can, when you build a house, you can call someone, <laughs> like a geometer, and uh, someone who can, uh, met metrologist. He can certify, he can sign with an insurance and everything that this point coordinate is exactly exact and so on, right? But it would be one point at a time. <laughs> exactly. It would just be the corners of your building and that's all. But if you come with 100 million points per kilometer, then you <laughs> I, don't, I cannot imagine that, yes. Yes. But you are right, that's, that's a big issue. OK, so now I start lifting a bit the hood into some of the classical approaches. Uh, for many of you, uh, the more senior ones, you know that by heart. But let's say I want to be a little bit also uh, covering this family of approaches. You have a family of approaches. Remember the assumption, simple, piecewise linear. For this assumption, the very basic tool, very classical set of approaches are based on Voronoi diagrams and Delaunay triangulation. What is a Voronoi diagram? Okay, that's a data structure that is deduced constructed from the set of red points you see on the left. And uh, the definition is very simple. In this Voronoi diagram, here in 2D, you have that uh, a cell, a Voronoi cell. We associate, we associate to each side here, PI, uh, its Voronoi, Voronoi cell such that it's a set of points closer from this point than all others. OK? <coughs> so that means that. Very extremely simple but powerful data structure. If I show you here, if I place two points, OK, in that case, you see the bisector between these two. It just the Voronoi diagrams is form of two regions that are infinite here. And of course, this line is a bisector, so equal distance and orthogonal to the segment A and B. If I call this point the two point A and B. And then if I add new points, I will have a data structure. And the adjacency between these cells 
encode notion of proximity between the points. Okay? And then uh, what is very nice is that once you have this Voronoi diagram, then you can deduce a dual data structure that's called a Dolonet triangulation. Let's say that the simplicial, so it's a set of simple, it's a simplicial complex here, the, the, the green lines here and the vertices, such that k plus one points form a Delaunay simplex if the Voronoi cells have non empty intersection. Namely, if you have two Voronoi cells that share a Voronoi edge, namely the intersection is non empty, you simply connect these two dots by an edge. Okay. <coughs> So that means that you can almost uh, forget, okay, if I, if I show you that, if I place <coughs> just full points, this is my Voronoi diagram, okay, and I can deduce a Delaunay triangulation, and of course, if two points get closer, you see, there is a change of connectivity of the triangulation, okay. So this is very simple data structure. You can even forget about the Voronoi diagrams, almost. And this, this is a canonical way to triangulate a set of points. And because that encodes the notion of proximity between the points, we can make an assumption. We can make the following assumption. We, ca we say that assuming a dense enough sampling, the sampling is dense enough, okay, that is, is sufficiently dense because this Delaunay triangulation encodes the proximity between the points, I should have in the Delaunay tri triangulation the right triangles I'm looking for. Okay, you see that assumption? For the moment it's just intuitive. <laughs> and that means that here I have drawn, here I, I rendered a set of uh, triangles that form the whole 3D Delaunay triangulation. Okay. This data structure works in the arbitrary dimension. You see there are many triangles, many edges, but I want to keep only s a subset of them to form this triangulation that will be connecting the dots. Okay. And now what does it mean, dense enough? Right? Now that's a critical question, of course. And um, the thing is to answer this question, okay, I have first to define the notion of medial axis local feature size and epsilon sampling. You know, if you think of this uh, signal theory, you know, these Shannon conditions. So now, in fact, there will be some analog here condition for sampling of surfaces, okay? Because it's not an ordinary signal, there is some new notion here, like topology. I need to go and uh, discuss this, uh, these notions here. So, what's the medial axis of a shape in 2D? Uh, so suppose I draw a curve that's the boundary of a solid. Okay, that's the boundary of this pink solid. Suppose uh, I have, I now I will draw uh, the set of maximal disk, namely the disk that are maximal, by tangent, at least by tangent to the shape. For the moment I draw the disk, okay, imagine you grow disk, and you grow it until it becomes either bitangent or three tangent or more. You can also put disk outside. Okay, you have disk outside and inside. Okay, you have an infinite number of disk if the shape is, especially when the shape is um, curved, like smooth. And if you look at the locus of the centers of all these disk, this draws the medial axis. In some literature, it's called skeleton. Right? Skeleton, why? Because it's, it's in the middle, right, of the shape. Okay. And uh, an intuitive understanding of this structure is suppose you, uh, you put this boundary on fire, okay, you put it on fire, and the fire advances on the grass at uniform speed. Where the two fronts of the fire meet, that we draw this uh, medial axis. Okay. Okay, so now uh, the nice thing, and I will skip some of the detail now, but the nice thing is that if you are, your shape, this is a shape, okay, is sufficiently well sampled, then the Voronoi vertices, I remember that these Voronoi vertices are this guy. I forgot to, to mention that before. <coughs> so I remind you that when you have, this is a Voronoi diagram, this is where you have three 
Voronoi cells meeting, three Voronoi cells meeting, this is a Voronoi vertex. And this is a, a point where you can place a disk because this is equidistant from these three points. Okay? And a nice property is that if your shape is sufficiently well sampled, then the Voronoi vertices turns out to be a good approximation of your medial axis. Okay? And I will show you uh, also maybe a small demo of that. I can even draw a shape. I'm using the Seagull library um, to do this. So suppose I draw a shape like that. I can smooth it, make assumption that it is smooth. I sample it, and you see where are the Voronoi vertices, right? You see that this is indeed an approximation of the medial axis of that shape, okay? But I should not have a point everywhere else that on the surface. If I would put one generator here, you see what happens? Okay, my medial axis is completely doomed, okay? <coughs> I continue. So now, what's the definition of local feature size? The local feature size, it's if you want intuitively, that's the analog of notion of uh, period of a signal, if you want. But this time, it's defined only on the curve, and it's simply the distance from that curve to the medial axis, okay? You see, for this point, it's that is the, the local feature size. And the tricky thing is that this notion is not only related to the curvature, okay? I want to show you that maybe on this other example. It's related to three notions altogether, Curvature, of course, because uh, on this part, it's if you are here, you have an osculating circle, right? You have a, this is a circle that is tangent to the curve. Namely, this distance is connected to the radius of curvature. So in that case, yes, here is the curvature. But over here, where you have also a medial axis, it's rather something we call separation. Here in the middle, it's the thickness of the shape. So now you have three notions altogether captured by one scalar quantity, curvature, thickness, and separation. Okay? Because uh, just on this small demo, I will show you that if I have two shapes, I will try to draw two rectangles. Wow, it's not easy. Okay, I'm adding one. I can add another one. Okay. <laughs> you see that now, indeed, the curvature is almost zero over there. But I have Voronoi cells over here that tell about the separation between these two objects, okay? <coughs> that means that if I want to recover the proper topology to separate well these two objects that, that relates to the notion of topology, right? I should densely sample there to separate these objects. So now, what is an epsilon sampling? An epsilon sampling is a point set that is sufficiently dense such that if I take any point here, x, on that shape, if I grow a disk, if I grow a disk of radius epsilon times local feature size, and typically 0 0.1, I must have a sample point. Okay? If you do that, if you have this assumption, if you have this property, you have something we call an epsilon sampling. And the good news is that then there are proofs, there are proofs that, and I skip the proof, unfortunately, <laughs> that uh, if your sample, your sample is dense enough in that sense, you will recover the right topology. And I show you one algorithm, very famous, called the CRUST algorithm, okay, by uh, Nina Amenta. I think it was contributed in 98, something like that. You have a point set, okay, I remind you the goal, name, <laughs> rule of the game, I should connect these dots, okay? What do we do? We compute a Delaunay triangulation, that's easy. And you see that now, indeed, in all these edges, I have the edges I, I need, okay? This is a subset of the edges. That means I should get rid of a subset of these edges. Okay, and what does the algorithm? Simply compute the Delaunay triangulation and the Voronoi diagram. 
Once you have the Voronoi diagram, you look at the Voronoi vertices. And now, ah, I forgot to mention a property that's useful. <laughs> there is a property in the Delaunay triangulation, and I think I will illustrate it in this small demo. <laughs> there is a property in the Delaunay triangulation. It is that, I will generate only four points, uh, okay. There is a property in the Delaunay triangulation, is that, so I remind you, once I have here two triangles, I can draw the circumcircles, right? And of course, the center of the circumcircles are the Voronoi vertices, right? Okay, and there is a property in the Delaunay triangulation. It is that all the circumcircles are empty. They do not contain any of the other vertices of the triangulation. That means that if I take this, you see this circle? If I try to move it left to the toward the left and up, it will not insert this guy, it will flip an edge. Okay? To remain empty. Okay? So therefore, in that case, remember, we want to get rid of these edges. Then very simple, what you do, you insert the Voronoi vertices in the Delaunay triangulation. In that case, you will strongly violate this empty circle property. And once you do that, you see what happened to the triangulation. It has been augmented. And now I don't have any more these edges traversing the skeleton of the shape. Okay, that's one means to proceed. And then now I just keep the edges that connect the red dots, the black dots, and not a pink, not a pink pink or pink black dot. I skip some of the detail, I skip the proof, <laughs> but believe me, <laughs> this is probably correct if you have a dense enough sampling. Okay? And I have a demo for this little uh, approach also. So it's not very easy to see. I can show you an example in 2D. This is the crust algorithm. Uh, in that case, suppose I draw points. Okay? And this, in real time, I can also move a point. Let me see that. <coughs> yes, I think I can move a point. I can <coughs> render the Lono edges, Voronoi edges, and even the poles. Yes. So you see what happens now? Every time I insert, I move a point, what happens is that I need to update these Voronoi vertices. You see that? Right? And the reconstruction, the crust is in red. Okay? It's not obvious, but you can. Uh, uh, see that as an augmented uh, triangulation, what happens over here, okay? And indeed, you see that if this, these sheets are getting close to each other, if I would draw something like that, if I want the correct topology, I need to be dense enough to reconstruct this curvy part. And that would be the same if this part would be closer from this one, then you need to densely sample this part. There are also assumptions here. We assume that the shape is smooth, even C2, C2 differentiable, and so on. So, no question on the crust? Yes? Are you aware of any practical methods for computing the epsilon value? So, you have a guide you with the circuit. Yeah, I know the theory. Yes. But the epsilon lock of the site exists. Yes. So given a general context we shape, what is the practical method to compute determining that epsilon? Yes. Well, you, you have, of course, uh, methods like Delaunay refinement metho methods, right, to mesh a surface. But in that case, a chicken and egg, because you need to know ahead of time. It's a chicken and egg problem. Yeah. Exactly. You need to know. So usually you don't know the surface you are currently scanning. Either you have a strong assumption, you know what's the local feature size. In that case, you, would, you could even drive a scanning process until you match the epsilon. What should we do in practice? Yes. Well, what has been done, I think, in practice is, is more like, there are methods that are uh, called probing approaches, probing, that are simultaneously reconstructing and probing and then re-estimating the local feature size. But I don't think there is any proof of like efficiency of the probing process, something like that. Yeah, this is a this is this is a good question, but uh, this is very really like chicken and egg problem indeed. 
Usually, we are very conservative. We just say ahead of time, I don't want to miss the details below this feature size. And then, unfortunately, it's like brute force who are sampling uniformly at this very, very dense sampling criterion. Then it's massive uh, data set. So the message, yes? What do you mean by local feature size? It's the radius of the circle from the surface to the right. medial axis. Right, it's not simply the, the distance to the medial axis. Okay. So the local feature size is defined for every point on the surface. Mm -hmm. There, take the distance to the medial axis. Yes. That is the local feature size. That's all. But if I look at the generalization from crust to three D or many is the problem. Yes. Yes, you, that's a good question. I'm kind of sorry because I'm skipping some of the detail here. This works well, this crust in 2D, but in 3D you have already a complication, is that some of these Voronoi vertices can be very close to the surface. And in that case, you need to filter them out to select a subset of the Voronoi vertices, which are called the poles. Okay? The, all that is very well explained in these computational geometry papers. And indeed, very good question. I'm skipping some of the technical details here. Okay? But life is not as easy as that. <laughs> Just to illustrate the principle, uh, like the, the simplest 2D reconstruction algorithm. So the message I want to pass here is that several Delaunay algorithms, they are probably correct. Probably correct. You have a proof. Under the assumption that the data are perfect, <laughs> because that's enough, noise free. <laughs> okay. So this is never something we have in practice. Especially when you talk to people from, I don't know, DASO system or other people, which are practitioners, every time you give them a new sensor, they say, oh, it's very cool, new one. Now I can step back and measure more things at, at once. They don't use it to measure more data, usually. They say, oh, now we take it underwater, or I will take more data at once. Or they will tell you, okay, but it's too expensive. Can't you replace these expensive sensors by a Kinect? But I would agree to scan 100 times the shape. This is called super resolution. Okay, you scan 100 times, hoping that you can replace the technology by an algorithm. <laughs> okay, that's also another trend, and this is a scientific challenge for us. So many people from computational geometry prove that this is probably correct, and I recommend a book by Tam Alde. It's called Curve and Surface Reconstruction Algorithm, Algorithm with Mathematical Analysis. So these guys from this community, uh, they know what they are doing. <laughs> and for them, if there is not a proof, uh, there is no science. <laughs> I'm kind of sorry, but uh, for these people, this is the way it is. Okay? If you don't come with a proof of correctness, <coughs> if it works, it's okay. But for them, it, you have to know what you are doing. And this book explained that, all that. So probably correct in the absence of noise under their sampling. That's a very strong assumption. And that means perfect data. And we are not at all in this condition, especially in the geometry processing community. Okay? And that has motivated another thread of work, a very large thread of work uh, as well, uh, hundreds of publications as well, uh, that motivate reconstruction by fitting this time, not just connecting the dots and so on, but approximating implicit surfaces. So in that case, you are not going to search directly for a triangulation. You go indirectly by searching for a function, here a function from R3 to R. You see, it? that can be, for instance, that's an example like an approximate sine distance function. That's one example where you say that it, where the function is negative, this is inside the solid I'm looking for. Equals zero, that's the surface I want to reconstruct. And greater than zero, outside. Okay, this way you can imagine we can start devising a variational formulation that we try to solve for that function and then we will contour, we will extract the zero set of that function. That's very, very popular. And um, you have in literature many work like that. Some people the target sine distance function to the inferred surface, unsigned distance function, Hornung and Cobalt. Uh, you have also indicator or characteristic function of the, of the inferred solid from cache down. Um, the infamous uh, Poisson reconstruction method, and I must talk about it here. <laughs> this is a classical. And that matches the smooth assumption. Okay? This time it's like I will search not everywhere, 
I will search in the space of functions that are smooth, typically. OK, so um, I will accelerate a little bit. So now the goal is very different. You, they assume that they have as input the points, but augmented with oriented normals. So they assume that this is given. Frankly, this is a lot to ask, but let's say this assumption makes, this assumption is made here. Uh, for some of the scanners, you can have the oriented normals. So what they say, they said, I have this point with oriented normal, so PM. And the goal is to compute an indicator function, namely a function uh, that is either 1 outside the solid or 0 and 0 inside, or vice versa. Okay, that, That's called like indicator function from the oriented points. And how do you solve for that? That's called the Poisson surface reconstruction methods published at SGP. Uh, 2006, and in that goal, in that uh, formulation, the goal is to find the function whose gradient best matches the input normals. If you want, you see the input normals like the gradient of your function. And then you search for the function f, which is matching as best as possible, in the least square sense, this gradient. And this is indeed solving for the Poisson equation because you solve for Laplacian of the function equal the divergent of the normals. I remind you that the gradient of a vector field, that's a divergent. Okay? And this can be solved using a sparse linear system. You can solve either on an oak tree. You need to discretize and do some kind of finite element formulation, for instance. Or in the Seagull library, we do that on a Delaunay triangulation, okay? using a finite element formulation. So that's the uh, Poisson reconstruction method. And uh, if I can show you how it works, in 2D, you have a point set here, another point <coughs> set here. In that case, what I did, I computed the Voronoi diagram, and do that the Voronoi vertices. And then I'm able to label which is inside, which is outside. You see blue and red. That give me the oriented normals. And then I compute the implicit function over here. And then by taking the zero set of the function, I have a live demo of that, but I will be running out of time if I show all the demos. I can show you that yeah. offline uh, later on if you want. <laughs> um, and then um, that's an example uh, in, in 3D for surfaces. So uh, you have here an uh, input point set that is oriented. That means I'm able to show you a shaded point set. I take the normal and I take it you to shade the point. Okay. So there are oriented points. And then once we solve for the function we compute an implicit function that is not shown here. And then we can run any favorite mesh uh, surface reconstruction or surface uh, contouring algorithm. Could be marching cubes. Or here it's a Delaunay refinement algorithm that will extract the zero set of that function and perform the reconstruction. <coughs> What's the advantage? And I can show you maybe in a in a, in a small demo over here. What's the advantage is that, <coughs> do I have, what type of demo do I have? Maybe I can show you on a small point set. So suppose I have this data set. You see, do that points with oriented normals. You see that? I can add the normals. Yes, I have only the points. So if I would use one of these Delaunay-based approach, um, I can show you first the Delaunay-based approach. This would be this is the reconstructed surface. I can add the points. You see what I have? I have solved. This is I, I run I run one of the. Uh, it's a Delaunay-based approach. I skip the detail, but it's a, it's a Delaunay filtering basically. Huh? Okay. You see what happens? It's good, but if my point set was noisy. I'm passing through the to input points, so I suffer from the noise. Plus, I'm not able, in that case, to fill the hole. Huh? You see that it would be even filling arbitrarily over here. But if I would take the same point set and run the Poisson reconstruction, I don't know how long it would take on this small laptop. You see, so I solve. I'm using the Eigen library for solving on a Delaunay triangulation. See, it is solving. There we go. 
And then I'm using, and now you see the advantage that I have a kind of airbag now, right? The bottom has been filled by something because now I'm searching for, I'm solving for a global formulation, right? So now I have something that is intersection free, watertight, and I could, by the way, I could also have decided to mesh much finally this zero set. I can show you that. I have some parameters here. Uh, by the way, this is a Seagull demo. There is a 3D demo in the Seagull library. You can also install it or test it on your computer later on if you want. So problem with the Poisson, <laughs> is it perfect? Answer is no. When you have this difficult point set, I showed you before, very, very anisotropic and so on. In some cases, we don't, we don't manage to orient the normals correctly. When it's like that, you see, this is indeed the boundary of a solid, you see? This is what I have reconstructed. So in some cases, it's not really perfect like that. I can have that. In some cases, when the sampling is insufficiently dense, it's too sparse for these sharp creases, this is the, what the Poisson reconstruction will give me. Because also the Poisson reconstruction, there is no theorem, by the way, huh, for, the, for the Poisson, but if the sampling is not dense enough, you may have holes like that. You see, this is still a surface, right? The boundary of a solid, watertight. But now this crease is not well captured. So that motivates a quest, something I call quest for robustness, because really this is something we have been searching for. And uh, the quest, you know, is very vast. We can discuss that for a long time, but let's say I summarize a little bit. What can happen? You can have a perfect point set. You can have a point set with noise. You can have outliers. Outliers are points that are not even near the surface. And this happens when you take some uh, multi-view stereo approaches. If two points in an image are incorrectly matched, they will be in the middle of the street. Okay, for urban reconstruction, really in the middle of the street, no problem. You can have non-uniform sampling density. If you take also uh, some scanners that are known for that, it will be very non-uniform. You can have missing data. In many cases, you have missing data, especially indoor scenes with many, many occlusions. And worst case, you have even variable noise. And this is a Kinect sensor, because the noise in a Kinect is exponential as a function of the depth. So even the noise itself can be non-uniform. Okay? Then you can have all kinds of bad things happening, structured outliers, and you can go always in horrible uh, things underwater, I showed you before, this fish outlier thing. <laughs> this is very, very bad. So now the problem with the Poisson reconstruction is that it requires oriented normals, remember? And the problem I have with that is that very often normal estimation, suppose you are given only the point, estimating the normal already, that's a need pose problem. Second problem is that orienting the normals that's almost as hard as doing the reconstruction. First question we can ask is, can we deal with unoriented normals? That would be already much easier, right? Because we can't imagine that we don't estimate well the direction. But can we deal with unoriented normals? Okay? And that uh, has motivated a work that we did some time ago hmm. at SGP. <laughs> uh, <coughs> dealing with unoriented normals. So suppose I have a point set, you see noisy here, noise free, very dense, and here very sparse. In that case, can I measure the quality of the sampling? The answer is yes, we do that by using a Voronoi diagram, you see, we compute a Voronoi diagram. And then to characterize the quality of a sampling, that may answer part of your question, can we characterize the quality of a sampling? This is one proposal to do it. We measure, we compute the covariance matrix of the Voronoi cells. And if it's anisotropic enough, if it looks like a pencil, okay, it has to be pencil shaped. It has to be a pencil. If it's a pencil, you are good to go. Okay, if you have a lot of noise here, you are also in trouble. If you have outliers, we don't know how to deal with that at the moment. That motivates, uh, an, uh, motivated another approach we did at SGP 2007. And uh, it's called spectral reconstruction. So here, the message I want to pass is that be careful. If you want to be more robust, you have to pay the price with a heavier solver. Okay, like you, the, the price of the tool usually is increasing. I would love to have something like a free lunch thing, but here, for this part, at least there is no free lunch. 
How do we perform that? We first compute tensors. We estimate tensors for Voronoi cells. You see that's uh, not exactly pencil shape, but you see that once we compute the covariance matrix of a Voronoi cell, uh, we can do that in closed form. Huh? We can take the principal component of these tensors. And now, what I would like to do is not the Poisson equation anymore. Um, now, what I would like to do is to compute a function whose gradient align to this principal component, right? This is what I would like to have. And um, in case it's very noisy, I, ha I am in trouble. Because it's very, very noisy. You see that here, I have a Voronoi cell whose principal component is like that, tangential. It's the worst case. But uh, Tamaldi proved that if you don't have outliers, then even in presence of noise, you have not far from this cell a anisotropic cell. And indeed, you are here, you walk a little bit, and you find this guy, right? So we devise an approach where we walk from neighbor to the next neighbor, to the nearest neighbors, and then we compute the anisotropy of the union of Voronoi cells. And once we have a peak in the anisotropy, we keep this union of Voronoi cells. OK, then how do we compute the implicit function? Now, so now it's not points with normals. It's points with tensors. We compute an implicit function. How do we do that? This is getting a little bit gory. What we do, we are solving uh, for, we are going to extremize to find the maximum of an energy, which is the quadratic norm of the gradient f in the norm of the tensor. So you see the integral of gradient f transpose c gradient f, where this is a tensor. It says this term is maximum when the gradient of f is well aligned to the principal component, but independently from the orientation. Okay? So like maximum, minimum, maximum. Subject to what? Subject to a constraint that I have a budget, limited budget of what? This is a biharmonic energy of the function. Plus, I assume that with Kinan you saw all that biharmonic energy. Kinan is here or not? No? <laughs> Are you okay? Biharmonic energy, it's a bi Laplacian operator. That means I tell the solver, go ahead, align gradient f, but I better have a limited budget of Laplacian f, okay? Plus epsilon norm of f squares, that means, this is a tricky part, that means, oh, by the way, I would like the function to pass through the zero set, namely, I would like that the zero set of the function passes nearby the input point. That's my trade-off between data fitting and smoothness. You remember before I told you that? I want to have a balance between the two. This is my balance parameter. OK, how do we solve that? I need to accelerate. Um, then uh, the intuition behind that is that the solver will never return a function like that. We never do a function that is with a gradient like that and nearby in the other direction. Because this will be more costly with respect to my constraint of limited by harmonic energy if we do that on its own. So the solver will basically flip the pyjama okay, <laughs> of uh, the uh, shape I'm looking for on its own and give me the proper oriented surface. And how do we solve that? In fact, that's a generalized eigenvalue problem. We solve for EF equal lambda BF, where B is a Laplacian, bi Laplacian isotropic, and A is an anisotropic Laplace operator, because I have the norm of my tensors here. I solve that uh, with a tensor. So the goal now, um, this is one step toward our quest for robustness, because now this time, uh, OK, this is sanity check. Does it work? Answer, yes. <laughs> it gives me uh, something clean for perfect data. What is interesting is that if I start sparsening my point set, up to an extreme point, really, only a few points, I still extract the zero set. This is very resilient. A lot of noise, it still works. And now outliers, it is a little bit stable, but of course it's not intended to be uh, outlier resistant. And if we compare to Poisson, when Poisson starts failing because the sampling is insufficient to orient the normals, then Poisson fails immediately because if you flip one normal in Poisson, it will make a bubble to circumvent this, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to make a, like a circle around these flip normals. Yeah, this is an example of failure of the Poisson reconstruction when the input point size is difficult, where we uh, are stable. 
OK, so uh, how am I going to waste time? 15 minutes. Good. Thank you. So now uh, we go faster and faster. <laughs> Uh, this is now, we have been through quickly through this smooth case, a little bit of quest for robustness. What happens is I want to be piecewise smooth, and by the way, robust to outliers. I want all together uh, robustness and piecewise smooth. So then um, the motivation for the piecewise smooth is that you can have sharp features, you can have boundaries, you can have sometimes even non-manifold features in your data. Okay. So suppose you want to have robustness to noise and feature preserving. Of course, for feature preservation. That's an extremely hard problem. And this is where I believe that machine learning techniques should really improve things. Um, <coughs> so the approach we did in 2D here uh, is that, well, initially, we tried to tweak the implicit approaches. We tried to do that to say, oh, the implicit function, we will modify it locally, and so on. That's extremely ill posed, and uh, somehow we tried something completely different. Where this time, forget Delaunay, well, not completely, but forget this Delaunay uh, formulation, implicit whatsoever. It's the, the formulation is completely different. We say we have an input point set. We see that as a measure, a distribution of masses. Um, okay, distribution of mass, like a discrete measure. And we want to approximate this measure by another measure whose support are the zero and one simplices of a triangulation. Okay, so suppose you have some mass, like Dirac masses. And now I would say that this, I would distribute some mass uniformly on each piecewise uniform on the edges of this triangulation and also at the vertices of this triangulation. And now I will just solve an approximation problem in the measure theory sense. So, and how does it work? Uh, of course, how to measure the distance between two measures? Optimal transport. Uh, everybody is familiar with optimal transport or nobody? Or OK. Yes. <laughs> they should be. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. No, no, I will quickly summarize what, what this is about. And then, uh, how to then, first question. How do we approximate a measure by another one? Optimal transport. You have a champion over here. And then, <laughs> and how to construct a triangulation that minimizes this distance as well? For the moment, we have not a great answer. We just do that by a greedy decimation of a triangulation. Optimal transport. So suppose, very simple, very quick recap for everyone. Suppose you have a stack of sand over here, A, measure A. You want to move it to another stack of sand. Nobody wants to do that, but some people want. <laughs> on average, let's say. So, and then the, you want to minimize the effort to transport this measure to this other measure. In that case, you define a transport plan, pi, which defines how each grain of sand is relocated. And then the transport cost, this is the Wasserstein 2 distance. That's a one example of a distance, uh, very famous. It's basically the sum of the mass times square distances between the point on x to y. Okay, points where x to y. And this characterizes to define the effort it takes to transport. And optimal transport is the science of finding the optimal transport plan that minimizes this effort. Okay? The infimum for all the transport plan. So now uh, I would change the rule of the game because it's not a stack of sand, it's a point set. And I would say that I have a mass, unit mass on every point. Now my target measure is going to be a uniform density uh, density that is piecewise uniform on the edges of a triangulation. Okay? And this is going to be a hard constraint. Then, OK, I assume I uh, take another shortcut huh, to accelerate a bit. Suppose you know the transport plan for the moment. You know where each point is transported to. If it's to a vertex, it's trivial, sum of mass, square distance, and take the square root of that. If on an edge, if you know where you transport your mass to on an edge is trivial, sufficient to sort the point along the direction of the edge, you split your edge into beans proportional to the mass of each point, and then you have a closed form formula for the W2 distance. Okay? So now, how does it work? That means that if you give me a triangulation, I can compute in closed form under certain simplifications. 
the transport cost. Okay? And now what I do, I, we insert all the points in the Dodonian triangulation, and then we greedily simplify this triangulation where every decision to simplify this triangulation is guided by the cost of optimal transport. I'll show you just the final result, that's all. Put everything in the triangulation. I draw the transport cost. And then once we deci decimate, you see what happens. Now we uh, have, uh, indeed, a reconstruction. So this time, there is no implicit function whatsoever. It's just we throw in a triangulation, very dense, and we explore the solution space based on optimal transport. So now, what do we gain? We gain very large robustness, much improved. So this time, you see, plus, we can uh, faithfully reconstruct some of the features, some of the boundaries, resilience to noise, and even outliers. You see some outliers over here. This time, when we have some outliers, the assumption is that their density is not large. Otherwise, they would not be outliers. Okay? Therefore, in this formulation, they don't wait much in the distance. And therefore, the method is robust to outliers. More noise, it is resistant, stable. Even more outliers, it starts degrading. But it degrades sort of gracefully. Okay? And this is what we are searching for. We search for methods that are resilient to this type. OK, so this is, uh, I skip that. For surfaces, suppose I would like to have the same for surfaces. Surfaces, life is a little bit more difficult. Because in that case, we need, we cannot make the assumption that, oh, we transport the entire mass of a point just to one edge or to a vertex. In that case, for some reason that I skip, we need to use a fractional transport plan that we can split the mass, mi, into submasses. And then we, there is no closed form anymore on the triangulation. We need to split every triangle into beams. So suppose, you see, this is, a, by the way, this is a Voronoi diagram, a Voronoi diagram computed on every face to discretize every triangle. And then we say that every beam will receive some mass. Okay? So we fill the beam with some mass, but not randomly, not non-uniformly. It has to be proportional to the capacity, to the area of each of them, such that the mass is uniform on every triangle. Namely, if you start filling this beam, you will fill all the other beams proportionally to the area. Okay? And now, um, my variables Mij, if I have a beam Bj, Mijs define the transport plan. Okay? Who is transported to where? How do we solve for that? Answer is easy but very costly. <laughs> so uh, we minimize a linear program, sum of Mij square distance between Pi and the Bj with some constraint that, are that the mass is preserved, sum of mig equal mi, that the density is piecewise uniform on the simplices. So there is one variable that is density per simplex, and the densities are positive. Otherwise, the solver returns negative densities and so on. Okay? So if we do this, uh, we solve for the transport plan plus for a given transport plan, suppose you see this is a point set shape uh, sampling a triangle. This is a triangle. We solve for the transport plan. So you see these red lines define the transport plan. Who is transported where? And the, the, the blue level defines the density, the variable Mij. Now, what's nice is that for a fixed transport plan, I can relocate the vertices of a triangle to minimize the transport cost. Okay, it's like expectation maximization algorithm. And then I relocate the vertex, vertices of the triangle, and I can recompute the transport plan. And if I do that, in fact, my triangles will line up with the geometry nicely. Okay? So, and then what we do, I skip the detail also, we insert everything in the Dodonian triangulation in 3D. That defines a density per triangle. And we let a decimation algorithm, again, and relocation, right? So we decimate and relocate the vertices in accordance with these transport costs. And that generates these type of things. So you see, and triangulation looks like that at the end. This is um, not perfect. You see that you have four triangles covering one step. This is suboptimal, but looks like a little bit what we want to have at the end, right? It's a pure optimal transport formulation that's able to preserve the boundaries and the sharp creases with good robustness to noise. 
So the uh, big drawback does not scale at all. Okay, so we are currently working on an approach that scales much better. What do we gain? We gain robustness to noise, robustness to sparse sampling, feature preserving. We obtain this instead of that. So there are some virtues to do that, to have a direct formulation based on transport. Main issue is scalability. Cannot scale more than uh, uh, 100,000 points, okay? which is a toy model if you think about it. What's next? Um, <laughs> machine learning, of course. <laughs> All this, you could argue, is Manuel here or not? He's not here. So um, this morning you learned that machine learning is great to solve some of the problems. I really believe that here I made some assumption, remember? Piecewise smooth, simple, smooth, and so on. The big issue with my approach is that usually once I make an assumption, I will apply the same assumption everywhere in the scene. And this is where I believe that hopefully machine learning can help us learn the assumption that varies in a scene, because I could have not the same assumption for a tree, for a car, or for a building, okay? And we are currently working on this. It's really like exploratory research. And this, if some people want to uh, apply for us, <laughs> for an internship, or for some stay in our group, welcome. Uh, what happens today? Uh, you know, I thought initially that, okay, these acquisition paddings are done. But no, you have a paper coming up at SIGGRAPH. Very nice paper. I recommend having a look at it. Very funny. It's called the deep transform. And I love that type of thing because here they say, oh, by the way, if you give me an aquarium with some water, if I dip an object in it using the Archimedes principle, if I monitor how the water goes up when I lift, when I sink an object in it, by measuring the profile of the water elevation, and turning the object in a sufficient number of directions, I can reconstruct it. Super nice because if your object is transparent, not accessible, with plenty of occlusions, the water can go in every little hole and they can reconstruct that. So I think it's very nice because even 2017, you still have new paradigms for shape acquisition. This, this paper is amazing, it's very, very, very creative. But I think it's the method same as CT scanning. That's what? As CT scanning. Yeah, o o of course, if you think of, of course, all these medical things where they have projections and then they do this radon transform, if you think about it, the same type of ideas. But I don't know, I think it's refreshing. It's very nice to see that indeed today you have people inventing new approaches for acquisition. Yes, I agree with you. There's a lot of similarity with radon transform. Then you have also novel acquisition padding, something that has been done already in the past, but of course it's, that's not the final answer, is that today some people observe that there are so-called community data. There are people sharing data on the web, like photos and Flickr and so on. And that means because you have communities, for instance, tourists, you know, you have tourists going everywhere in the world, and this number is constantly increasing. You could argue, okay, they go, they take the photos, and that's all. I, I just have to sit and wait for the data and I can uh, crawl this data and use that for reconstruction. And that poses plenty of challenges for us in terms of robustness. Because when you have a tourist taking the photo of Notre Dame, very often there is a girlfriend in between. <laughs> okay? So girlfriend resi resilience is very hard. We are working <laughs> on that. Here, sensor networks. You have also novel acquisition paradigm, which is that sensor networks, that's a, for us, it's very, very interesting is that today we see that even some car constructors start putting sensors in the car for pedestrian detection and so on. That means for us it's very different, it's thinking differently. Instead of sending an expert, sending a plane to acquire data, there is a constant, maybe in the future there will be always a constant sensor network, always working. And it's our goal to devise algorithm to query this sensor network. That poses questions like fusion from heterogeneous sensors, can be very heterogeneous. Progressive acquisition, right? Because the city is always evolving. How do we do a continuous update of a reconstruction model in a city? And we start a PhD thesis with DASO system on this topic, right? Where you have a constant acquisition and you want to update the reconstruction. Um, high level queries, it's much harder topic because 
I'm like, I'm, I'm a geometer, so I want to have a faithful geometry uh, uh, reconstructed surface at the end of the day. But in fact, when you talk to practitioners that are from other disciplines, uh, like, uh, I don't know, historians, the historians, they will ask you higher level queries. They will ask you, what's the relationship of the style of that between these two cities in Europe? This type of question they ask us today. Okay, and the question is, how do we query a sensor network to answer the question and to find the correlations in terms of the style and so on of two cities, right? It's, it's, it's another way to also approach this problem. It's really beyond reconstruction. Uh, then, of course, uh, in terms of, if you think of 3D digitization, why do we want to work for that to make also societal impact? Uh, in my, my view, my view, it's very interesting still because, for example, you can make cultural heritage accessible to all. Uh, today, there are also big challenges in terms of telepresence, right? This is not a joke. I mean, this is really an evolution. Some people start thinking of making telepresence a routine via virtual augmented mixed reality. That poses questions like reconstruction in real time of humans and uh, streaming of this data, reconstruction, real time, and so on. And of course, the new era of mass customization, this is also, I think, very exciting. You start seeing some sign of that, that some people want, uh, as a customer, to be involved in the creation process, like to have uh, customized uh, objects for everyone. Maybe one day you will uh, uh, be able to enter a shop bike with not a single bike, because they will make a bike for you. <laughs> That's all. They will just scan you and make a bike out of you. So uh, I think this, of course, this is where reconstruction has to play a role. I recommend this recent survey that we published in the last year, uh, survey of surface reconstruction from Point Cloud. And if you have any question, I will be at HGP. <laughs> Thank you. How do we Okay. Uh, I'm interested in the work uh, of using non orientable normals for circuit construction. So the question is uh, what are the limitations? What are the opportunities for further improvement? Are there failure cases? Yes, it does not solve everything because the first issue we have this with this method is that is the, the scaling of the tensors. Right now, I take the Voronoi, the covariance matrix of union of Voronoi cells. And this tends, this will be input to the solver, an input to the solver. But we realized in some cases, it's not justified to use exactly these tensors. Because imagine you have two objects like that, exactly the same two spheres, right? You will have very large anisotropy maybe on one side, and here in the middle, less anisotropic because they are closer, which makes sense. In that case, that seems to bias, of course, the solution, the implicit function. So right now, the question is, the first question is the scaling of the tensors. We don't have a definite answer for that, that what we do is the right thing to do. That related to lack of feature size as well? It is related to, yes. It is today related to local feature size, indeed. But the anisotropy of the tensor, you see. The second failure case that we have is that, remember, we had an epsilon parameter trading data fidelity for smoothness. We would love to have an automatic way to find the best solution in a way that would be locally adaptive. This is where machine learning, I hope, can help us. You know, like a machine learning that tells us this epsilon, I will find you for you the best locally. Because right now, it's a user parameter. Just to tell you an idea, if you have two nested spheres like that, okay, nearby to each other, if this epsilon is high, you will separate the two spheres. If it's low, you will reconstruct one sphere. The two solutions make sense to you in one scenario or the other. But I don't have today a principal answer on how to select epsilon. It's another drawback. <laughs> Other drawback is the scalability. You need to solve for a generalized eigenvalue problem. You showed many successful examples in 2D. 
in 3D, I saw a little bit more. Yes, that's, that's right. right, yes. I did a sample of that. But what my question is, is it very robust for 3D noisy on cloud? It is impressively robust. <laughs> Believe me, I'll have a look at the paper. Yes, indeed. Yes. Sometimes you, you don't even believe it. You see barely few points sparsely sampled, and the zero set does something. <laughs> nope. Oh, one quick question. So you had in the very beginning a very nice uh, application for doing simulation at the city level of you. Yes. I, I always wonder what the sensitivity with different sort of reconstruction. How does the result change? So that's a good question because um, for the fluid simulation, it's not a big deal whether you reconstruct the sharp creases as uh, smooth surfaces or with a chamfer, if you want, or with a crease. But if you uh, talk to the people who run a simulation of waves, electromagnetic waves, you know, for the cell phones, for the 4G, starting from the 4G generation, the frequencies are much, much higher, and then it start diffracting like crazy around sharp creases. So for them, they will tell you piecewise smooth and accurate creases, extremely important. Accuracy less, you could shift a plane by uh, 20 centimeter, will not change much the solution, but the creases have to be, if they are sharp, they have to be sharp. So I don't have a definite answer to you, but sometimes it it's very varies a lot depending of, on wh what they want. For the fluid, thermal is not a big deal. It's more like watertight, absolutely watertight, and things like that. Is it possible to learn from the point cloud and, and select some uh, method that solve it? Uh, some kind of machine learning? Or uh, another question is, is it possible to combine different methods to, to reconstruct the uh, This is a very good question, because I think this is where we have to go today. Because um, today, I'm not aware of an approach that can really, there are methods that are data driven. Huh? I skipped this part, okay? It's mentioned in the survey. In the survey, it's mentioned data driven and so on. But I would love to have an approach like what you say. I would say, oh, locally in this area, it's a kind of a tree. So uh, over there, it's man made. Over there, it's piecewise smooth. Over there, it has to be closed, watertight, and so on. But um, Machine learning today, no, we didn't do that, but recently we had a paper in 2013, I think, at SGP, where we were dealing with noise adaptive. It's a method that is noise adaptive that can locally adapt to the level of noise. So if to some extent, if you want, we can locally say, oh, here there is a lot of noise. We can, therefore, we can relax the faithfulness of the data, while over there, if there is no noise, we'll be extremely faithful. So, that's the thing we are able to do today. It's very limited if you think about it. But at least the, the method, to some extent, varies on the surface. But then uh, changing completely the methodology today, to my knowledge, it's, it's not yet possible. But uh, I agree with you. We would need something like that. Like an, an urban scene, it can be, you, can, you have free forms. You can have uh, uh, piecewise planar, uh, piecewise uh, uh, something, uh, yes. Uh, that would be great. And this is, I believe, where machine learning should really help. And the great thing with uh, just reconstruction is that to generate the training data, this is extremely easy because you can even take a CT that you made in uh, SketchUp by hand, and then you sample, you simulate a laser scanner, a Kinect, or whatnot, for uh, one week if you want. Then you have plenty of training data. So making training data, I don't think that's a big issue for us. Um, if you want to be within a limited range of uh, assumptions, like piecewise moves and things like that. All right, let's thank you again. Thank you very much.